They were arguing again. Stella, her nose stuffed from a cold, her lungs clogged, wrapped her arms about herself, flopped down on the couch, and grabbed for another tissue. She blew a puff of air to get her hair out of her eyes, which were watering and itchy. Her hair felt too long, her body too clammy. She thought she had taken a Sudafed a bit before, and then another later, but if she had, they weren't working. Simon was leaning against the dining room table, still wearing his lucky traveling clothes, black t-shirt, black jeans, black boots. Lucky because he was afraid of flying, and he thought that something as simple as a uniform that once got him through a transcontinental flight filled with turbulence, lightning, and oxygen masks would be a talisman to protect him. Planes terrified him, even though he'd memorized all the precautions. In the event of a crash, you were supposed to sit with your legs firmly planted apart, not in the fetal position the way everyone else was. Otherwise, you'd break your legs and never be able to walk or even crawl away from the burning fuselage. Bring your own food so you didn't get food poisoning or sour your stomach, and never, ever take a seat at the front or in first class because that was the part of the plane that broke off first, snapping like a hard pretzel. Disaster. Everywhere he looked when he thought of flying, he saw disaster. His suitcase lay open on the table, a jumble of dark clothing. Hers was on the floor, everything in tight rolls, more than enough for the week she was taking off from her nursing job at the hospital to go with him. He was staring at her the way he would if he didn't know her, which he'd been doing more and more lately, something that unnerved her so much that she wanted to shake him, point to herself, and say, I'm right here. All you have to do is look. She took another sip of wine, just to calm herself, maybe to add some heat to her body, to stop the queasiness rolling through her. Outside, it was another freezing February New York City winter, the snow blazing down in sheets against the windows and layering over the sidewalks. There was a blizzard advisory for an accumulation of 12 inches, complete with school closings and warnings for the elderly and the infirm to stay inside. It was the main reason they were here tonight in the apartment. The airports were closed, and their flight to California wouldn't be rescheduled until tomorrow night at the earliest. The weather was too snowy for them to drive. Plus, they didn't have enough time. Simon's band was once successful. But that was 20 years ago, when she had first met him, and he was just 22 himself, and his band was riding high with Simon's mega-hit song, Charlatan Eyes. Simon didn't even really sing back then. He was just harmony and played bass guitar to the lead singer Rob's aching wail. Once, Stella had even heard the song as Muzak in an elevator at Macy's, and while everyone else in the elevator seemed to ignore it, she flushed with pleasure. Over the years, the band still played for decent-sized audiences and recorded a few more albums. A few more songs got some play, and Simon began to sing more of his own songs. But the band didn't build. The audiences and the stages their manager booked became smaller, and the awards they were all so desperate for never arrived. The band had reached a crossroads. Their manager was thinking of retiring, and Simon was worried that he was about to slide into rock and roll obscurity and never escape. He kept reminding himself of all the older musicians he knew who still toured and played and had no intentions of ever quitting, because what else was there but the joy of this? His band had kept on, even in the face of younger and younger bands, younger dreams, too. Dad rock, someone had once called the band, which Simon knew meant you didn't rock at all. But now, all that could be different. Just last month, the band had been playing at Lobsters, a dive on the New Jersey shore, all chipping gray cement walls and scuffed floors, no chairs or tables, so you had to stand. Then this guy strode in, and for a moment, Simon hadn't recognized him. Not until the guy lifted his face and took off his dark glasses and Simon saw those familiar, odd green eyes. He saw the gleam of oil that slicked back that famous wild mane of black hair, and there was Rick Mason, 26 years old with three Grammy wins to his name, settling against the wall, leaning forward, and listening to the band. Really listening. 
Afterward, Mason even came backstage and told them how influenced he had been by their early work, how when he heard they were playing this joint, he had his driver bring him right over. He talked about how blown away he was by Rob's voice, how it soared so high that it made him feel like every glass in the place would smash. He talked about Kevin's drumming, and then he turned to Simon. Charlotte's and I's, man, he said, shaking his head, awed, and Simon froze in wonder that Rick Mason actually knew he was the writer, that the two of them were actually sharing the same space.